On one day every year, health workers in the Philippines take a little time out. It's an opportunity to let their hair down, to mark their achievements. But not everyone is taking part. There's one disease that gives no respite. It's a major public health concern. Yeah, it's one of the most common cause of hospitalizations in the country. A lot of children are suffering. You really don't know if she or he will die from the disease. There's no cure, and until recently, no vaccine. The disease is spreading rapidly. For developing economies, it's a huge burden. And for the rich, the door is open. Now half of the world's population is at risk. I was convulsing with shivers and shakes, and I was cold, I was hot, I was wrapped up in blankets. Uh, it was actually quite frightening. A vaccine is urgently needed. Millions are living in fear. If you ask parents or even doctors, they will tell you it's one of the most feared disease it's dengue. 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 For decades, scientists across the world have been racing to find a vaccine for dengue fever. In the community where I live, lots of people ask me what I work on. I say, I work on a vaccine for dengue virus. And they're like, you know, what is dengue virus? They haven't heard of it. But this devastating disease is on the rise. And with every day that passes, more and more of us are going to become familiar with it. In the 70s, only nine countries in the world declared outbreaks, dengue outbreaks. Now, more than 120 countries declare dengue outbreaks to show you the spread of the disease around the world. The World Health Organization has set an aim to halve the number of dengue deaths by 2020. In the last 50 years, there's been a 30-fold increase in infections. A vaccine could help meet that goal. But the search has been painfully slow. After 50 years of sustained dengue vaccine development, we still have no vaccine, no treatment for a disease that affects nearly 400 million of persons around the world from every ages, from infants to adults. Finally, scientists have an answer. But still, the number of dengue victims just keeps going up. More and more families are left grieving the loss of a loved one. Yeah, yun yung ano ko yung bali eldest ko. Yung nakamamatay lang noong lola niya. And then nagpunta kami doon sa bahay ng biyanang ko. Tapos din naiwan mo na doon yung mga bata. Tapos nga nung ba pang eight days nung lola niya, naligo daw sa dagat. Ayun, doon na, ano, nilagnat siya nung hapon. And then kinabukasan naman, din na pinacheck up ko naman sa doktor. Tapos, uh, di nga siya nakatulog nung gabi. Tapos, uh, ikinuntay na namin sa ospital. Eh, bali, eh, two days lang siya doon sa ospital. Namatay na. Dengue. Ano, mabait na bata. Kayo pala, eh, sandali lang namin makakasama. Ma, ano siya, hindi naman siya umanong kasi nga mabilis yung nangyari sa kanya. Kaya parang ang, ang anong tanggapin na ano kasi nga six ng hapon, naku, mataos na. And then six ng maga, kinabukasan, namatay na. Pero ano, sayang, ang bait-bait nung anak ko ngayon, yung bata. Kaya... Unfortunately, the experience of Angelita and her family is far from isolated.
with nearly 400 million infections every year, as many as 100 million people worldwide get symptoms of dengue. Muita dor de cabeça, muita dor atrás dos olhos, a cabeça meio tonta assim. E aí, é, eu tava todo mundo falando sobre a dengue. Essa doença, eu acho que foi a, a pior doença que eu já tive. Eu nunca tinha tido tanta dor, tanto cansaço, tanta moleza. Eu nunca tinha sentido nada igual. Children stay at home. Adults can't go to work. Family income is lost. Half a million get the severe kind of the disease that can be fatal. And it's in the rainy season when things are worst. At this time, right across the tropical world, hospitals are overwhelmed with cases of this debilitating disease. In many places, dengue is the leading cause of hospitalization. For pediatrician Dr. Ruth Tugowin, Dengue provides the bulk of her workload. For the Department of Pediatrics, we have a lot of cases, admitted cases of dengue for this month. And most of the hallways are occupied with dengue patients. Since the rainy season, dengue, it boom. About 180 to 250,000 cases of dengue occur here in the Philippines. So uh, that's a lot. And uh, out of this, about uh, 500 uh, or more are dying because of dengue. Actually, when the rains come, it's the number one disease. It's the number one problem of the government, of the Department of Health. Nose bleeding, vomiting, abdominal pain, these are severe signs of dengue. So they have to be admitted. Sometimes these wards are three to a bed with dengue cases. My son is vomiting and vomiting. Vomiting blood, nose bleed. I'm so scared because he's my son and then he's crying and crying. In the most severe cases, the patient goes into shock with internal bleeding. Fast medical attention is then critical. The worst thing that can happen to dengue, they can bleed to death and they will be in irreversible shock. That's when the dengue is so severe that we cannot manage, uh, we cannot, uh, if, even though we give full support, the patient might die. Eh, siyempre po sir, kasi sabi po nila minsan may namamatay doon sa dengue. Ay, upo, natatak na nga po kami mga kapitbahay sir eh. I've traveled to areas in Vietnam, in Thailand, in India, where I see hospitals that are full of young children who have dengue fever. I see a lot of people coming in every day for treatment. It's heartbreaking. For dengue, there is, of course, a human impact, which is hugely important. But there is also an economic impact, which is important as well. And when you have an outbreak of dengue in a city, for example, in a big city, everything stops. Economy, public health structures collapsed because the number of patients and the economic impact of such uh, outbreaks are very, very important, especially in emerging and developing countries. The cost of dengue globally to healthcare systems is almost $9 billion, which is a huge burden for developing countries. And it's Asia and Latin America that are seeing the biggest outbreaks. Like malaria, dengue is a mosquito-borne infectious disease. But the dengue mosquito, Aedes aegypti, bites in the daytime, making prevention more difficult. It thrives in wet, tropical regions 
and breeds in stagnant water, feeding off people as a source of blood. Without a cure or vaccine, people have been suffering from dengue for decades, natives and visitors alike. Casualties, victims of attack. The enemy, dengue fever. It was when American troops started falling ill in the Second World War that efforts to develop a vaccine started. Carried by the female Aedes mosquito, striking down large groups of men with blasting violence, 10 dengue casualties for every combat injury. A few at first, then more, then still more. Long lines of them, out of action when we needed them most, with success or failure of our mission in doubt as a result. In the 70 years since, vaccines for other infectious diseases have made a huge impact across the world. Smallpox has been eradicated. Polio largely wiped out. Huge advances have been made against measles. But year after year, dengue continued to outwit the best scientists. The field has spent 40, 50 years trying to develop a vaccine to dengue. There's been some small successes, there's been some small failures. If we finally can accomplish this goal, it will be a scientific breakthrough. The scientists here at the National Institutes of Health in Washington, D.C., think that they've made significant inroads. It's been years in the making, but now their vaccine is being tested in volunteers. We are currently conducting early phase vaccine trials, either first in human trials, so the first time a vaccine has been given to humans, or early evaluation looking primarily at the safety of a vaccine. So what kind of side effects does the vaccine um, cause in people. The trials for this vaccine are small, involving about 20 to 50 people. The idea is that they should give early signs of whether or not a vaccine is safe to use on humans and whether or not the results look promising enough for a bigger trial in an endemic country. Around the world, other teams of scientists have also been battling to find a working vaccine using different approaches to tackle the complex disease. The city of Lyon in France is home to one of the world's largest vaccine producers, the pharmaceutical company Sanofi Pasteur. Experts here have spent decades working on a vaccine for dengue. Jean Lang, a director of research, has dedicated his professional life to it. We are here to make an impact on people, and really that's what drives me and, and the team, because you know we are hundreds of people working along these 22 years on that. It has been long, and we really keep uh, this resilience with the team, uh, so that we keep our objective in mind, that we wanted to bring this vaccine to population. But why has finding a vaccine for dengue been such an immense challenge? A vaccine for dengue has been a very hard nut to crack, mostly because you need to make four vaccines, because there's four different types of dengue. You can't just make a vaccine for dengue one, dengue two, dengue three, or dengue four. It's got to be a four-in-one vaccine. You have to develop, basically, a four-combination vaccine from the start, because all four dengue viruses are responsible for dengue epidemics and even the severe form of the disease that could be uh, lead to hospitalization and to death. To find a vaccine against one virus can take 10 years. We're trying to find a vaccine against four viruses, and then we're trying to have those four individual vaccines be put together into one vaccine and still work as well. As scientists struggled to outwit the virus, dengue has continued to spread. From Asia, through Africa, now it's exploded in Latin America. 
an epidemic in Brazil in 2015, led to at least one and a half million people coming down with dengue. El dengue en América Latina es un problema de salud pública sumamente importante porque ha constituido en el transcurso de los últimos años un problema importante no solo por la frecuencia en el número de casos, sino por el número creciente en las formas severas de la enfermedad. En el transcurso de los últimos 20 años, el incremento en el número de casos de dengue ha sido dramático, que llegan a requerir hospitalización, con brotes importantes en países como Brasil, México, Colombia, Honduras, constituyéndose entonces en un enorme desafío de salud pública. Dengue patients of all ages need constant monitoring, saline drips, blood tests, and possibly blood transfusions. It will really make a big difference if there's a vaccine available, because these patients would not be here in the first place. And of course, if a vaccine is available, less burden on the families. Without a vaccine, the patients have kept coming. And unlike with other infectious diseases, having had the illness once is no guarantee you won't find yourself back in hospital with an even worse infection. With any infectious diseases, we have a degree of protection afterwards, so we don't get disease again and we're protected. In dengue, after your first infection, which in many countries is as a child, you then get second infection a few years later, and that second infection is more severe. That's very unusual, and it's specific to dengue. It's really a very, very interesting virus. When you're infected with dengue, dengue one, you make antibodies to that dengue one virus. Those antibodies can kill the dengue one virus. But if you're then infected with a dengue two, or a dengue three, or a dengue four virus, those antibodies sort of recognize that virus is part of the dengue family, but they can't kill the virus. In any potential vaccine for dengue, the strains compete, with one tending to become dominant. So getting the balance right is extraordinarily hard. Dengue is really unique in that, and it makes it from very interesting to study, but also very challenging for vaccine development. In the meantime, the problem is intensifying. Because of climate change, in many areas of the tropics, Indonesia for example, the dengue season is getting longer and longer. Ya, biasanya itu terjadi pada saat musim hujan, yaitu sekitar bulan November, Desember, Januari sampai paling akhir bulan Maret gitu. Itu uh, 20 tahun yang lalu gitu. Nah, sekarang ini berubah Dan ini juga uh, sangat-sangat tergantung dengan perubahan iklim itu sendiri pada saat ini. Seperti tahun kita lihat sepanjang tahun itu musim hujan. Dan sepanjang tahun juga kasus demam berdarah itu tinggi. More rain means more breeding places for the mosquitoes. Well, just this morning we had a thunderstorm, so we had a flash flood, but it's the remaining water that takes some time to disappear, and maybe, maybe can also be a breeding ground for mosquitoes, especially if it stays long in an area, it doesn't move, it's still, and it's clean, relatively clean, because these are the areas or the breeding spots that the particular vector for dengue loves to breed. Uh, this particular water clean stagnant. In urban areas, there's plenty of stagnant water. Every puddle, every flower pot, every barrel and paint pot is a potential breeding ground for the dengue mosquito. So the growing cities of the developing world are like a magnet to them, and from there it spreads, thanks to us. I think it's a classic 
disease of the 21st century. It's driven by a mosquito that loves living in big cities where lots of people are congregated in a small space. Environmental change is undoubtedly having an impact on where the mosquito lives and the disease is spreading um, through travel, through migration and urbanization. If I have the dengue, maybe I have a low-grade fever, I still feel well, for example, but the, the dengue infection is in me, I'm infected. So I go around and the mosquitoes in that area will bite me and they can just transmit the disease to other people in that area. So I, I'm the one who's spreading it actually. It's easier nowadays to travel from one place to another. And if you're infected of dengue that you don't know, you'll be spreading the disease to other places that you go to. Without a vaccine, dengue has been free to spread. Anywhere that is home to the Aedes aegypti mosquito is at risk. And with climate change, the mosquito is at home in an ever-increasing area of the world. And this means it's no longer just a tropical disease. More and more of us are going to become familiar with the diagnosis dengue fever. Here in the American state of Florida, life is far removed from the mega cities of the developing world. For three years, Marty Baum has worked as keeper of the Indian River. More than most, he's familiar with mosquitoes in the area, but they've never been anything but harmless until now. It gets into your system like a fever. Well, my wife and I had recorded a Miami Dolphin football game, and uh, we propped up in bed. We were going to watch it. And at 9 o'clock, I was perfectly fine. Um, by 10 o'clock, I had 102 fever, 102 and a half, and I was convulsing with shivers and shakes, and I looked just like one of those World War II malaria yellow fever movies. Uh, I was sweating, I was cold, I was hot, I was wrapped up in blankets, uh, my wife was wrapped around me. Uh, it was actually quite frightening given that there was, no, there, was, there was no clue as to why I was sick. This was something quite new for Marty. He had never experienced anything like it before. Usually you have a twinge when you're getting the flu, an ache, a gland, something tells you, oh, you're about to get it. There was none of that. So to be caught cold like that and have a fever jump so high out of nowhere uh, was kind of frightening. I told her, if it gets any higher than this, uh, take me to the hospital. And uh, it was a long night. When the fever got worse, Marty's wife rushed him to hospital. He was there for the next 10 days. And he was very surprised to hear that he had dengue fever. It's not something that you normally see here in the States, uh, in, in Florida. Sometimes you see it down south uh, where there's a lot of immigration from the Caribbean, you know, Dade County and Broward County, uh, but it, it just really shocked me. People always want to know, is dengue coming to this country? Is dengue coming to that country? An example would be the United States. So in, you know, Florida, along the uh, Texas-Mexican border, the, the mosquito that transmits dengue is already there. Florida and also Miami, we have the type of mosquitoes that transmit the virus. So it's naturally occurring in Florida and it just would take a traveler coming infected with the virus and then being bitten by one of our local mosquitoes and then the mosquito gets infected and infects someone else. We can't let our guards down because we have the mosquito here anyways in the traveler's world, we'd be coming to visit Miami. With global travel ever increasing, more and more mosquitoes are becoming infected, as Marty found to his cost. There was really no relief for the pain. When they called this thing the, the bone breaker fever, they, they got it right. It used to be thought of as a purely Southeast Asian disease. It's now in India, it's in South America, it's in Southern Europe, it's increasingly in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. 
in Florida and recently in Japan. So dengue is becoming one of the truly global infectious diseases. In Florida, the state has resorted to spraying insecticide daily in high-risk areas to kill the mosquitoes. In the developing world, this has long been a tactic. Here in Jakarta, Indonesia, so-called fogging is used regularly when there's been a severe outbreak in a particular neighborhood. It does have a short-term effect, but it tends to just push the problem to another area. Right now, the strategies that uh, we have against dengue is very difficult to implement. Because all of these are uh, taking a toll on the environment, and it's very expensive also. In fact, about $6 billion is spent globally every year trying to control the mosquito population. And until now, it's been the only weapon against dengue fever. Dengue is a vector-driven disease so it is logical that we have to control the mosquito vector. Hopefully, if we bring down the mosquitoes, then we also decrease the number of uh, the possible transmission and consequently the number of cases of dengue. This school in the Philippines has nearly 4,000 pupils. Even here, the children are at risk from the disease. A few students here died because of dengue mosquito. We don't want other pupils to be affected also. We are really afraid of it. The teachers do what they can to prevent the children getting bitten. At four o'clock every afternoon, the pupils are set an important task, to rid the school of any standing water. They're looking for stagnant waters and those places where mosquitoes can hide. The sweeping so that mosquitoes may be swept away. At another school, rather than getting rid of standing water, they're using it to deliberately lure the mosquitoes. This is an OL trap, ovicidal or larvicidal trap. And the purpose of this is to catch mosquitoes so that the mosquito will lay eggs inside the trap. The smell of that chemical attracts the mosquito so that it will lay eggs inside. These initiatives are educational for the children. The effect of them might be limited, but the fear of dengue means that there's an overriding feeling to do something. For the past 10 years, we have a victims of dengue here in school. Look at our place. During rainy season, our place is flooded area. So we can stop the mosquito that lay eggs by putting this trap. We have to be involved. We have to act. We don't just sit on the problem. We need to act on it, right children? Yes. Yes. Acting on the problem includes educating the children about dengue from a very young age. One, two, three, go. See, mosque, I, mosque. And nothing sticks in the mind more than a song about the most famous Edis Egypti, Mosque the Mosquito. Edis Egypti, ayaw namin sayo. Education, raising awareness, and attempting to control the mosquito population are nothing new. It's what the Americans were doing 70 years ago. Water collected in rubbish heaps, on fuel drums, in ruts. Each pool and puddle was a mosquito nursery. Millions of wrigglers hatched, took off, 
visited nearby native villages, fed on dengue-infested native blood. Then, it was that simple. Multiply it by thousands and you get what we got, trouble, lots of it. Getting rid of standing water was the policy the Americans were advocating back then. It's important for the immediate area, but as with education, it can never be the whole answer. The mosquitoes will remain free to breed elsewhere. So scientists are experimenting with more innovative ways to control the mosquito population. They're looking into biological control, from genetic modification to infecting the mosquitoes with a common bacterium to stop them transmitting deadly diseases. They're even developing new odors based on human body odor to foil the insects. And these mosquitoes have been infected with deadly fungi. I think these other measures, mosquito control, genetically modified mosquitoes, community participation, getting the community involved in dengue control, the way we design cities, um, all of these are going to be very important in controlling a dengue infection in the next 20 years. But it's also true that a vaccine would be truly transformative for this disease. Angelita and Arento, who lost their first son to dengue, were given the opportunity to help develop that vaccine. Two more of their children went on to be hospitalized with the disease, so the family were anxious to find a solution. city health house to house experience ko sa ano sa mga anak ko. Sinali ko siya para nga makatulong yung pag -ano nung sa vaccine. Their son Christian was enrolled in trials for the Sanofi Pasta vaccine. The tests have been on a much larger scale than the ones in Washington. Volunteers in 10 dengue endemic countries have taken part, and the vaccine has now been tested on over 30,000 people. Christian has to have regular checks at his local health center. Napakahalaga dahil nagkaroon kami ng gayang probya, ibig ko ako mga anak ay nasa hindi magkaroon na dati nagdanas na sa amin gaya na namatayan. Sa susunod na may dapat ay masagpo na yun, kaya kami sumali dito, dito sa konto. He and hundreds of other children have been vaccinated as part of the trial, looking at both the safety and effectiveness of the injection. Dr. Maria Kapading, who is in charge of the study, is checking to see how the children are doing. We have children coming here for their yearly visit. These children have been vaccinated with the dengue vaccine about three years ago, and they're coming here for going to ask about has there been a hospitalization, has they had febrile the illness. We call it the surveillance phase. Some children have been given the new vaccine, and others a placebo, and they're being closely monitored. If any of these children get dengue, the clinic is immediately informed. To get to this stage has been a long, hard journey. The team face so many challenges, but each time we have to innovate. Because we have a classical infectious disease or target, you, you can say, look at the book, look at the experts. Here, we were writing on a white page. So each time, when I started and say, well, you cannot do any efficacy trial in dengue, it's not possible. When I say, why? Because simply, we never did that before. With Latin America showing the most rapid increase in dengue cases, doctors here were keen to take part in tests for a new vaccine. As the disease spreads northwards, Mexico is now in the front line of the fight against dengue. Hemos tenido evidencia de brotes muy importantes en México, por ejemplo, 
en el año 2014 se presentaron más de 63 mil casos con cerca de 34 mil formas graves de la enfermedad. Soy Sandra Villagómez, soy pediatra. Estoy llevando a cabo un estudio de la vacuna de dengue. En este momento vamos a ir a la clínica donde estamos llevando a cabo el estudio de la vacuna contra el dengue. El estudio en México abarcó 1.350 niños, entonces en esta área con alta densidad de población y alta prevalencia de, de dengue. Throughout Latin America, over 20,000 children and young people have taken part in these tests. Son niños adolescentes que ya tienen participando con nosotros cuatro años. No hubo dificultad en, en reclutar sujetos para el estudio, ya que la mayoría tenían una historia de enfermedad en la familia. Entonces, eso ayudó a que todos los niños quisieran participar. The state of Morelos has the highest level of dengue. Here, over 20 schools got involved. High school student Aida Gómez had a particular reason to volunteer. She knows how awful dengue can be. Me sentía muy débil. Tenía mucho dolor de cabeza, mucho, mucho dolor de cabeza. No me podía levantar de la cama. No podía mirar hacia arriba porque tenía un dolor de cabeza muy, muy fuerte. Y tenía dolor de huesos, tenía calentura. No podía estar ni sentada, ni parada, ni... O sea, me sentía muy tensa, muy... Tenía que la cabeza me, me estallaba. Entonces, cuando nos informaron acerca de esta vacuna, pues se me hizo como viable probar la vacuna para ver si realmente funcionaba o, bueno, qué tan efectiva era o qué resultados podíamos tener. Dr. José Luis Arredondo was in charge of the study. He has over 40 years of experience working with infectious diseases in children. He's seen the benefits that vaccinations have brought over the years, and at the same time, He's seen the problem of dengue spiraling out of control. The problem in Mexico of dengue has been increasing year by year. And the measures that have been taken to eradicate the vector have not solved the problem. There is the necessity to look for new alternatives. The results of the worldwide trials have been encouraging cutting in half the number of expected cases. More significantly, the results show an even greater drop in the number of most severe cases to less than a fifth of what would have been expected. The most important thing, I think, from the clinician point of view and also from the parents' point of view, that this vaccine protects around 88% from having the severe type of dengue and also from being hospitalized, around 67% against hospitalization from dengue. Personalmente, me siento muy optimista en el sentido de que vamos a poder disminuir considerablemente el número de casos, la gravedad de los mismos y el riesgo de muerte. Nosotros estamos esperando buenos resultados con esta vacuna. Esta población tiene dengue siempre, entonces el tener, contar con una medida eficaz para control del dengue es muy importante para todos nosotros como médicos y la población en general. Me da gusto, me parece algo, formar parte de algo a lo que, bueno, tendría resultados muy positivos para todas las personas. Sanofi Pasteur are already building a huge production facility dedicated solely to the dengue vaccine. The vaccine might not be effective in every case, but still news of its approval by several countries is causing excitement across the medical world. At last, after 70 long years, a vaccine against dengue is available. We've been used to having vaccines which are unbelievable. 
100% effective, safe in everybody, and that's what we've got used to. We're moving into a world now where those vaccines may be less effective, but can still have a major impact on public health. And I think we shouldn't be too disappointed with something that we say is 65, 70% effective, because that may actually reduce the burden of disease such that less people go to hospital, less people have time off school, less people have time off work, and it would have a big public health impact. When you look at so complex diseases like dengue, you could not expect to have immediately 100% effective vaccine. So you come with a vaccine with 50-60% of efficacy, of protection. So it's really, in my opinion, a public health tool uh, that could be very efficient. A vaccine that is 60 to 70% effective could well swing the balance in the fight against dengue, as long as it's part of an integrated approach to fighting the disease. It's not the only component in the control of dengue, because you also have uh, mosquito control, you have education, and you have vaccination. You're not going to be able to control it solely by having a vaccine. You're not going to be able to control dengue solely by having mosquito control. So everything, you know, using everything of each of these elements will, in our opinion, allow to control dengue. In other words, if you use only one tool, it will be not possible to control dengue for long-term control. We have to find a synergy between vaccination and mosquito control. Researchers around the world continue to search for other effective injections against dengue. And more work will be done assessing the impact of the new vaccine. There's going to be a lot of players in this, and we don't need just a single dengue vaccine. There's room for many players. No one can produce all the vaccine that's going to be necessary to take care of the dengue problem worldwide. But the first vaccine is a start in meeting the World Health Organization's ambitious goal. A 50% reduction in dengue deaths is a step closer. What we have in hand is the vaccine that could do the work and meet these objectives, and I think this is really an exciting time. We are close to the end, and all the efforts at the end will make an impact, and we have all hope to make dengue a vaccine preventer disease. Everybody in the dengue community is exciting about the dengue vaccine. We are entering a new era in which we will have a new hope. As a mother, as a clinician, as a doctor to children, and also as an individual residing in a dengue endemic country, I'm very happy. Yeah, very happy to be part of this journey. Meron na solusyon kung makakuha na ng gamot na, kung dumating na yung gamot na ano sa dengue. Malaking tulong yun para sa ating ano, komunidad. Sakit ng bata kung ano man, para hindi na lumala, kaya sumama na, sumapi na kami sa ganitong ano, program. Masaya dahil nakakatulong sa Christian has played his part in helping to make medical history. With the first vaccine against dengue fever now available, there is hope that its relentless spread can at last be curbed.